Um, hello and welcome to the uh, Greek British Shipping Forum. Uh, those eagle eyed among you will uh, note that I am not the ambassador. Uh, I'm Joss Danderwick, Chief Executive of Maritime London. Uh, the, the ambassador is experiencing a few technical difficulties, uh, as is often the way uh, with these platforms. Uh, but we very much hope uh, that uh, Her Excellency will be able to join us uh, after I've provided uh, a few opening remarks. Ah, ah, and uh, the ambassador is here with us. It's lovely to see you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, as we were discussing, I'll, I'll provide a few introductory remarks and then and then pass over to you, if that's all right. Okay, I, I, I think you might still be on mute, Ambassador, uh, but we'll see if we'll see if we can sort that out uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, anyhow, whilst we hopefully try and sort out these technical difficulties, uh, as I say, I'm exceptionally pleased that even during the continued restrictions uh, and due to the very hard work of Marina Aravantakis uh, at the Embassy uh, and Olga Jakes at Maritime London, we've been able to continue what is fast becoming a tradition of the Greek British Shipping Forum. This year, of course, in its first digital iteration. Uh, while we have traditionally been privileged to being able to hold the forum at the ambassador's residence, uh, and again, you know, uh, my, the, my current surroundings of my back garden shed aren't perhaps quite uh, as salubrious. Uh, I have no doubt that we will be in for an informative uh, and I really hope interactive afternoon. For those who have attended, attended Maritime London webinars previously, uh, you will be pleased to hear that we'll, you will not have to endure my moderating today, uh, as I will soon be passing the floor to Maritime London Director Britt Pickering uh, and Camilla Slater of Shipowners PNI, who will be moderating the first session, exploring how the London and UK market is supporting owners and managers through th sanctions compliance. And then from 15.30 Greek time, 13.30 UK time, uh, Andy McKeeran from Lloyd's Register will chair a session exploring how the market is supporting the shipping industry as it moves to comprehend, monitor and utilize technology to ensure compliance with IMO GHG emissions regulations. Before I hand over to Britt and Camilla, uh, I will run through some housekeeping uh, and do my best to explain some of the functionality of the platform we are using today. Uh, firstly, if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, uh, you will see a menu of the different virtual rooms you can quite literally hop into. So directly after the first panel, there will be a one-to-one -one networking session and then another networking session after the second panel. Uh, we have a great list of attendees today, so don't miss the opportunity to make new contacts or perhaps uh, have a chat with old friends. Uh, and please refer to the event schedule for more information and times. Uh, we would also uh, warmly invite people to visit the expo area. Uh, whilst it is qu not quite the Posidonia exhibition, uh, you will be able to find information about all of the members presenting today uh, and talk to members of staff from their respective organisations and swap virtual business cards. Uh, and for those who don't have the time to join today, please note that the expo will be open uh, up until 1800 BST or 2000 EEST on Friday, June the 18th. Uh, and we'll also be uploading uh, the recordings uh, of, of the two sessions uh, to that area. Uh, we also actively encourage uh, attendees to use the Q&A function to ask questions to the panels. Uh, and you have the, also have the ability to send direct messages to an attendee for a video meeting during the sessions. Uh, and if at any stage you are virtually lost, then just click on the area with the red label uh, and that will, direct, di that will direct you to where the action is currently taking place. Uh, and if things get really serious, uh, just put the issue in the chat uh, and the team will do the very best to assist. Um, now, unfortunately, I can see that the ambassador has had to log off again. Uh, and maybe what we'll do is see if she might be able to join us at the at the beginning of the second session. Uh, so for now, uh, in order that we don't ho hold up the schedule too much, uh, I'd like to pass over to Britt and Camilla, uh, who will be moderating the first session. So Britt and Camilla, thanks very much. Uh, and over to you.
Ah, brilliant. Um, well, good morning all and welcome. Um, perhaps it's a good idea just to start with some introductions, um, a little bit more than, um, than Joss has, has mentioned. So my name is Britt Pickering. Um, I am a director of Maritime London. I'm also the Claims and Legal Director at Shipowners Club in London. Um, and I've worked at the club for over 18 years. I'm a qualified solicitor and my role here is twofold. I oversee all P&I and defence claims globally for the club. I also oversee the club's legal fund, which of course encompasses the thorny issue of sanctions. And good morning, I'm Camilla Slater and I'm head of legal for the club. I practice, I've practiced rather as a solicitor for a number of years before joining the club in 2007. As Britt has mentioned, one of our core functions in legal is to manage sanctions risks for the club across all of our offices. And so that's London, Singapore, Hong Kong, and of course, Greece. So it's really great to be in a position today to co-chair um, this seminar with Camilla, albeit remotely, which isn't as good as being in person, of course. Now, I mentioned earlier that sanctions is a thorny topic, and it is, and it's because the landscape changes so very often, and also sometimes it changes incredibly quickly. Owners, operators, brokers, insurers, banks, just to name a few, have to keep up to date and they have to keep compliant if they want to operate. The penalties for getting it wrong significant and can actually ultimately force an organization to cease trading altogether. And it's against this backdrop of all the significant penalties that the shipping sector must operate. My mantra, um, if I have one, since joining Ship Owners Club um, has always been to ensure that we as insurers support our members in their primary goal. And their primary goal, I think, is to keep trading, keep their vessels operating and moving and to keep making money. Of course, claims happen. Um, collision claims between vessels, um, cargo claims, contractual disputes, all manner of claims. And they're all there um, to disrupt our members in that primary goal. It's our aim as a club to make sure that we mitigate that and, and we believe that we're expert in doing so. Um, sanctions are very similar. Um, in that ability to derail um, a, a member. Um, and we absolutely recognize our role here is to assist where we can to keep vessels trading and operating in full compliance. And um, so before we start, um, just a really quick um, reiteration of um, what Joss has already said, which is just to remind you that if you have got some questions, please do put those on the Q&A function. And that's where we'll be able to ask questions. Um, and the chat it would be fantastic if you would take advantage of that too, because um, as Joss has said, that will be a very useful networking opportunity. Fantastic. So today we're going to hear from, um, from a number of speakers. Um, Daniel Martin is going to set the sanctions scene. Then we have Camilla Slater, who is going to give an insight into the role of P&I insurance and uh, the support that the club can give its members in relation to sanctions. We're also very fortunate to have Neil Roberts with us today to give us a Lloyd's perspective. Um, and last, but certainly not least, we have Simon Ring from Polestar. And Simon will guide us through the technical aspects and in essence, how technology is there and has evolved and continues to evolve to assist us. Their talks will really focus on the management of sanctions risks. And I think that that is important. It's the management of. So let's get started. Um, Olga, I wonder whether you might upload the slides. Um, while Olga is doing that, I'll just introduce Daniel. Daniel is a partner at Holman, Fennec and Willen, and I'm sure is no um, stranger to, to many of you. Daniel advises traders, ship owners, freight forwarders, insurers and brokers on a host of regulatory and compliance issues, including international trade sanctions, export controls, customs, and anti-corruption um, issues. He advises on all aspects of the EU and UK sanctions legislation, and he is also very familiar with the application of US sanctions to non-US persons. Daniel also advises on disputes arising from charter parties, sale contracts, bills of lading, marine insurance, and logistic operations. And he uses that expertise to provide detailed, practical, bespoke advice. So, Daniel, without further ado, over to you. 
Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, thanks, Britt. Thanks to Joss, um, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, it's sunny-ish in London, um, and certainly not as nice as it would be if we were in Greece, but um, nonetheless, nice to be able to join you. Um, I've been asked, to, as Camilla has said, and Britt have said, to set the scene in about 10 minutes. Um, so um, I will try to focus really on the main points. Um, and as Britt has said, really, the focus here is on managing risk. Um, this is an area in which there are significant restrictions in place and significant penalties um, for getting it wrong. But the real focus is on identifying and managing those risks. Um, unless we're able to manage the risk, um, they will have a catastrophic impact on trade. Um, and really, the function of lawyers and insurers and others is to help to, to navigate ship owners and operators through, through the minefield that is the, the sanctions um, landscape. Well, if you could perhaps move to the, the next slide, please. Um, just right. So just to set the scene, these are the, th the three things I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to look at where we are in terms of the landscape um, very briefly. Um, then I wanted to focus a bit more closely on the various different ways in which we've seen um, the US, uh, the UK and others really turn the focus on shipping. Um, and really, that's why we thought this was a, a topic that was well worth considering today, um, because certainly from a, a US and UK perspective, there's very much a focus on shipping and trade. Um, and then I'll spend the bulk of the 10 minutes that I have really thinking about how, from a legal perspective, we can manage some of those risks. So on the next slide, what we've got is just an overview um, which looks to set out um, the sanctions landscape in, in broad terms. What we've sought to do on the slide um, is something that we do for clients a lot, which is to try to map out the risks. As I say, the continuing theme through the session will be on managing risk. And clearly, the way that we manage risk is first by assessing the risk. Um, identifying the jurisdictions we need to be concerned about. And what this map does, and um, this is our assessment rather than being an official assessment, um, but what it seeks to do is to really to answer the question, which is as a ship owner or operator, which particular jurisdiction should I be particularly concerned about as giving rise to heightened sanctions risks? Now those heightened sanctions risks might arise because the sanctions against a particular country target commercial operators, and therefore, um, in your commercial day-to-day -day activities, you're more likely to come across sanctioned individuals or entities within that particular country than in another, where those sanctions might be more targeted at military individuals. So that's one of our first risk factor. Our second risk factor is in understanding the extent to which the sanctions evolve rapidly over time. Um, Britt has alluded to this already, but one of the challenges, um, and I suppose one of the things that's enabled me to spend the past 10 years of my career advising almost exclusively on sanctions issues, um, is that they're, not, they're never the same from one day to the next. And um, there's always a slight danger whenever I put together a deck of slides, I can almost guarantee that something will change the day after I finalize the slides, um, which renders them slightly obsolete. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that the sanctions are imposed in response to political developments. Um, and therefore, living in a somewhat volatile time, um, we can expect sanctions to continue evolving. And clearly, if the risks, um, if the sanctions landscape is evolving rapidly, then from a managing risk perspective, it creates additional challenges. While things are relatively static, and we know where we are from one day to the next, but if they're changing every day, then it creates a particular challenge. And for some of these sanctions programs, um, the, the, the incidence of change is greater than for others. And, and that, as I say, heightens the risk. And the third factor I thought it was worth mentioning is really the potential for discrepancy between different um, sanctions regimes imposed by different governments, different bodies. Clearly, if we have alignment across UK, EU and US, and those are the only jurisdictions that are relevant to you, then you can be confident that if you understand one set of rules, you will be um, well protected under all of them. But of course, if the different rules are pulling in very different directions, um, then it creates a real challenge. You've got different rules to, to, to understand, different risks to manage, um, and at least the potential for there to be um, conflict and contradiction between the different rules. So that's what we sought to do there in terms of mapping risk is, is seeing which sanctions programs give rise to the greatest risk. On the next slide, what I've done is just set out a couple of um, recent-ish developments, certainly over the past year or so, um, really coming out of the US. So on the left-hand side of the screen there, you have a joint advisory that was issued by US um, Department of the Treasury, Department of State, and the Coast Guard really targeting um, shipping and insurance. Uh, I and a number of others were at meetings um, at the US Embassy beginning part of next year, 
when this guidance was being discussed. And it has certainly been under discussion for a long time, but it really shows um, a focus on, on the industry. Likewise there, the quotation comes from a, pres a presentation that David Payman, who at the time was a, a US government official, gave uh, what was that, sorry, a year and a, a few months ago. Um, and the point David was making when he gave that presentation was really to say, reading between the lines, that the US is looking closely at shipping. The US expects shipping to um, evolve and to understand the sanctions risks um, and to manage those. Um, and therefore, I think what we've seen, um, certainly from my perspective over the past decade or so, is that the focus of the US has moved from banks onto insurers um, and is now very firmly on owners, operators, and indeed traders. On the next slide, I've set out a number of the specific things that the US has identified um, as being particular um, indicators, I suppose, of a heightened risk associated with particular voyages. Um, and I know a number of these points will be picked up um, by other speakers to follow. Um, a real focus from the US side on AIS tracking um, and the extent to which um, gaps in AIS are indicators of, of sanctionable activity. Um, we can talk all day about that. Um, from a personal perspective, I think it's um, significantly overstated uh, on the US side. I think the US would like to see um, uh, AIS is always an indicator of sanctionable activity, um, whereas, of course, those in the industry will understand and appreciate um, that there are other reasons why there are gaps in, in AIS data, but, but certainly a big focus on the US side. Also focus from the US on things like ship to ship, um, and that's the, the map there shows particular regions that are being looked at carefully in terms of ship to ship transfers of oil um, in connection with the North Korea sanctions program, but also focus from the US side on on vessel registrations and flag states um, and on changes in ownership and ownership chains. So as I say, a number of practical things that the US has identified. And I think with that comes both heightened awareness and therefore we understand the particular risks. But I think at the same time, there comes a heightened expectation that people will appreciate that the US is looking at these things and therefore those within the industry will, will treat them as risk factors. And certainly a large part of what we do is in um, analyzing particular voyages, particular um, lines of business in order to be able to advise on the risks. Um, if we move to the next slide, please, Olga. Um, what I wanted to just touch on briefly is I think in so to some extent, um, a sanctions presentation is a relatively easy one for a regulatory lawyer to give because this isn't one of those areas in which we have a risk um, and it's difficult to point to enforcement and therefore it's difficult to assess how seriously to take it. Um, this is absolutely a space in which there is aggressive enforcement by the US. I've just put a few examples on there. Um, so these are all vessels that were temporarily um, on the sanctions list. Um, important to emphasize that they no longer appear on the list and I've included on the slide there the dates when they were removed from the sanctions list. Um, but, but those instances are, are evidence, if any evidence was needed, um, that the US is very much looking to enforce against shipping interests. And part of this, of course, is about ensuring compliance with the sanctions programs, um, but it's also by indicating to the rest of the industry that this is something that the US will do. Um, and of course, they hope that it has a significant deterrent effect on others. And then moving on to my final slide, um, what I wanted to focus on just for the final uh, three minutes that I've got left um, were some of the things that, that we do um, to help our clients um, and to help it manage these sanctions risks. What I've identified there are some of the key challenges that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and as I say, you know, we've, we've been working in this space for 10 years. What we tend to see are patterns, um, issues arise either because there's been a change in the sanctions landscape um, or alternatively, we see that particular business opportunities are being discussed in the market and therefore it tends to drive um, particular lines of inquiry. Um, and I think one of the benefits it gives to lawyers in London and elsewhere who are focusing on this area is that often we will have looked at the same issue um, for a number of different people um, and it makes it somewhat easier to keep on top of this um, changing landscape. So there are challenges, um, as I put there on the first couple of bullet points, in terms of who you're dealing with. Is it your direct counterparty or someone else who's involved um, in the operation? But anyway, the, the issue there is in, in ensuring um, that you are not dealing directly or indirectly with a sanctioned person. Um, and that tends to lead, leads to a requirement for due diligence, um, making checks and being able to document those checks. 
likewise moving down the slide concerns around sanctioned cargo so some of the sanctions programs will impose restrictions on particular commodities it might be oil and gas it might be equipment for drilling um, it might be luxury goods it might be coal it might be charcoal and um, but there are these wide restrictions and therefore we will help clients to understand whether the particular trade that they're being asked to engage in is um, is targeted by sanctions that affect the cargo Issues around insurance and around banking, I think I'll leave to others to talk about. Um, but that final bullet point of the first block there um, around considering um, suitable drafting, so sanctions clause in charters. Um, BIMCO have done a good job of drafting um, sanctions clauses to be included in time charters and in voyage charters. And indeed, there's a container line, container specific clause. Um, but sometimes where we're asked to help is in drafting bespoke wording. Um, either because there are particular scenarios that are not covered um, by the standard wordings or just because there's a desire for some other reason um, to draft more broadly or to pick up other issues. So um, something we do a lot of. Um, another significant part of the work we do is in drafting sanctions policies and indeed in assessing policies. Um, and one thing that I would certainly encourage um, everyone who's attending the session um, to think about is that we will be um, rolling out a program to offer um, a quick um, and relatively um, painless and, and certainly free exercise to benchmark um, sanctions policies. So what we're doing as a firm is um, putting together a short list of questions that we can send to people um, and certainly whether through the networking forums or elsewhere, very interested to hear from people if people think that would be something that would be of value to them, really just to understand where they are in terms of what we see more broadly um, around um, sanctions policies that are adopted. Um, the final thing to say, um, and so sort of wrapping up my time um, is another significant part of what we do um, is dealing with regulators. Um, one of the issues that I suspect will come out through all of the presentations is the extent to which sometimes sanctions legislation is unclear, um, sometimes intentionally so, um, and therefore we are in a fortunate position where we have good relationships with regulators, um, UK, EU, US, um, and are able to have informal conversations. So just this morning, I sent a note to my contact at the UK authority really asking a question about whether they agreed with our interpretation but on a no-names basis and that way we get um, an indication of where they're thinking. Um, apologies, I've slightly overrun. Um, Britt, thank you very much for your indulgence, um, but um, I look forward to the, the Q&A um, later. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think that was um, really helpful and it really did, I think, um, set the scene for, um, for, the, for the other speakers. So thank you for that. Um, Camilla, you're up next. Um, I don't need to introduce you because you already have. So um, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Britt. Um, so starting then with my first slide, um, just to begin with, I'm going to just speak to you a little bit about the Ship Owners Club um, on the next slide, please. So one of 13 international group clubs, we are a market leader in provision of P&I and associated insurances to small and specialist vessels. Um, we insure approximately 33,000 vessels across a range of sectors, including tug, barge, tankers, passenger, yachts and fishing. And we have a spread of around 8,000 members across a range of geographical areas. We're particularly proud of our Greek representative office seen here in the photo and based in Piraeus. We opened our Greek office in 2019 and it looks after our 220 Greek members who own and operate 450 vessels between them. Moving to my next slide. As you can well anticipate, where it comes to sanctions, the club's overwhelming priority is to protect our members. And we do this in many different ways. As many of you who have been involved, involved rather in the sanction space will be well aware, sanctions continuously develop within a complex landscape. And what is most important we feel to be aware of is that there may be an issue with a particular operational proposed works and then to know where to look or who to ask for further guidance. At the club, we provide a wealth of information on our website, but we also do try to raise awareness through these types of events, webinars and conferences. And of course, we're always happy to um, address individual queries from our members from whom we regularly receive a good deal of, um, it, of questions and requests for guidance. Now, the vast majority of members, of course, operate entirely properly and lawfully and with low risks of sanctions. So our main purpose with sanctions is really to guide, assist and protect members who may be innocently carrying out activities that are potentially sanctionable. We are certainly not here to be hampering perfectly legitimate trade. 
Now, as well as raising awareness and providing guidance at the club, we also carry um, using technology, and we'll speak a bit more about that later. Technology is an important tool, and what I would like to emphasize is that this is simply part of the picture. Tracking and screening results tell you very little unless you have an underlying understanding of what you are looking at. And this is important sanctions regimes in place and how they might be relevant to the results provided by that software. Now, it is certainly not lost on us at the club that the focus these days is not only on vessel owners and operators, but also, as Daniel has already mentioned, on many others within the maritime industry, including insurers and brokers. You need only look so far as the OFAC advisory in May 20, um, addressed just now by Daniel, um, um, and addressed to the maritime industry, in which a number um, of players in the maritime sphere, including insurers, are advised to assess those sanctions risks and implement compliance controls. Um, specific guidance is given sector by sector. And as Daniel has said, there is no doubt that the US, at least in particular, um, is looking to the entire industry to play its part. Um, and finally, I just wanted to highlight on this slide that the impact of sanctions is potentially very severe to the club as a whole if individual members are in breach. And so therefore, it is in the interests of the membership as a whole that we monitor and advise on sanctions risks. And this therefore clearly remains a key priority for the club. Moving to my next slide, please. So I have already mentioned AIS monitoring or tracking, and here I'm just going to elaborate a little bit further. You'll be well aware that IG clubs implement sophisticated compliance procedures, and tracking is part of that suite of tools deployed by all IG clubs. Tracking allows us to identify activities such as port calls in sanctioned countries, abnormal, nav abnormal navigation, manipulation and switching off of vessels, AIS transponders, and STS operations in high-risk areas. And there's no question that this monitoring can help the club to reach out to members and make sure that they're fully aware of sanctions which may impact them. Um, bearing in mind, of course, as I've already highlighted, that the vast majority of members wish to operate entirely free of these sanctions risks. Next slide, uh, please. So I thought it might be interesting for me to provide you just a little look behind the scenes in terms of how we practically operate our screening and tracking processes here at the club. Now, in terms of screening, this is a task that we carry out um, in our underwriting department using specialist software. And each name of each insured and every name of every vessel is to be insured is run through our screening system. And no quotes can be bound unless we receive a satisfactory result. Our system instantly screens against a multitude of databases, including, as you would expect, EU, UN, and OFAC. And even after the checks have been passed, the story doesn't end there, as the system will continue to screen behind the scenes, and we need to regularly check back to ensure there has been no status change. So you can imagine this is quite a chunk of ongoing work that we need to keep on top of on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so you may wonder, how do we carry out the task of tracking the movements of literally tens of thousands of vessels? Well, fortunately, it's not one that we are actually, you know, sort of got a bank of desks doing in-house, if you like. And we contract out that work um, to a specialist software provider. And that provider issues us a weekly report identifying any vessels that have breached a set of parameters which we pre-agree with the provider. So that would include, for example, calls at um, sanctioned countries such as Iran or AIS being off for a certain period of time um, or not being received at least um, and which could have facilitated a call at a sanctioned country um, and an SPS with a designated vessel, those kinds of things. So we organise ourselves as a team, literally each week we run through the list um, methodically and we decide what action if any is needed. So you can see from this pie chart that um, versus actually the approximately 33,000 vessels entered with the club, actually relatively very few have been identified by our provider since September of 19 as having actually breached the parameter set. In fact, only 194 altogether out of those 33,000, um, of which at the time of writing, 16% of the 194 have left the club where we haven't been able to satisfy ourselves as to risk and 5% is still under review at the time of writing. So it's, it's not really that many vessels versus the number that we have entered, as you might expect, but it's clearly quite a lot of um, ongoing work that needs to be done um, to make sure those risks are managed. 
Now, clearly, the software has sophisticated algorithms, and so many false positives are avoided. Um, but that doesn't mean there is no work for us. Um, there are limitations of AIS monitoring, and which I'll now speak about um, in, with my next slide, please. So I think most involved in the arena of AIS monitoring will agree that it is really not the whole solution on sanctions. Simply because a vessel has been highlighted on our weekly report doesn't in any way mean that it has breached sanctions. It's really just the start. There is always more work to be done by us at the club in dialogue with the owners to work out what has gone on. The AIS information only tells us one side. To really understand what's happened, we always need to hear the other side of the story. And there can be, there can be legitimate reasons for switching off AIS. For example, if a security incident such as piracy is imminent. And sometimes, for example, owners might advise that the transponder, the AIS transponder has broken um, and they can evidence that and that it needs to be repaired. Hence, there'll be a lack of transmission. Um, other times, before we even speak to our members, we can do a bit of homework of our own. We can look not only at the information, um, AIS information, but also we can look at the vessel type, the cargo carried, the parties involved and the exact activity in question. So, for example, looking at vessel type, that can start to help to answer the puzzle. For example, as we know, US Venezuelan sanctions are fairly heavily focused on the oil sector. And therefore, although we might need to ask a few questions on the face of it, a non-US owned bulk, bulk carrier appearing on the report as having visited Venezuela is perhaps less likely to be a risk. And similarly, by looking really carefully at the exact location of the AIS track and discussing with our members, we can quickly rule out any potentially risky activity. For example, uh, the Salman oil field spans the waters of Iran and the UAE, and some of the UAE oil platforms are within 500 meters of the Iranian border. And therefore, we have in the past identified offshore vessels very close to Iranian facilities, but further inquiries show that they're working within the UAE waters of the Salman field, um, therefore, albeit rather very close to the border. Um, now, vessel spoofing is highlighted in advisories, and we do see that as becoming more and more commonplace. I certainly don't pretend to be an expert on how this is done, but it is essentially a method by which bad actors steal the AIS identity of another vessel and use its IMO number, thereby concealing their vessel's um, own illicit activity. An inevitable consequence of such spoofing is that innocent vessel owners can be surprised to learn that their vessel is falsely reported as being potentially thousands of miles from its actual location and possibly even being implicated in sanctions evasion. So recently on one of our own um, reports, we were surprised to see that a vessel matching the IMO of our French flagged uh, passenger vessel was highlighted. Now our entered French passenger vessel has trading limits within Mayotte, a French island in the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean rather. And therefore the information uh, that she had visited North Korea was more than a little surprising. Um, a vessel of this type was unlikely and potentially not even capable of performing um, a trip to North Korea. Further investigation revealed that she that this vessel was actually a Chinese flagged vessel that had called in North Korea, or, but using the IMO of our entered French passenger vessel. So uh, conscious of time now, just a few final thoughts. At the club, we are here to advise and guide. Uh, technology is part of the suite of tools. It is not the entire solution by any means. The vast majority of members wish to trade risk-free and we really see our job here to help facilitate that and protect our members and the club as a whole. And we also see our role more widely as able to influence as part of the international group of clubs, both with respect to regulators and also within the uh, wider shipping audience. So, so thank you for your time. That's, that's what I've had to say just for now. <laughs> thank you so much, Camilla. Um, I think that was a really useful behind the scenes um, view of how we deal with sanctions here at our club. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Neil Roberts. Uh, Neil is Head of Marine and Aviation at the Lloyds Market Association. Neil joined the market in 1985 and he's responsible for marine and aviation activity at the LMA. He is also a member of the IUMI Political Forum. So Neil, over to you. I can see myself, so that's that's an improvement. Excellent. So, good afternoon. I'm, I'm from Lloyd's Market Association, as you just heard, representing the underwriters in the London market in the marine sector. And somewhat surprisingly to me, at least, this is my 36th year in the market. 
The combined direct London market, being Lloyd's, syndicates and IUA companies, is a subscription market, sharing and writing a very broad spread of risk, and writes around £60 billion worth of premiums, being at the centre of the international maritime nexus that supports global society. And of course, the London market has very strong and enduring links with the Greek shipping world. In my role with Joint Harland Joint War Committees, I was involved in the drafting of the market sanctions clause, which is a key component in protecting the market. And beyond that, each syndicate and company has a detailed compliance programme to address the ever evolving sanctions regimes. I was involved in the negotiations and conversations with the US State Department and OFSI before last year's maritime advisories came out. And I was involved with the production of the market's AIS clause, which I'll come to a bit later. Both the sanctions and AIS clauses highlight the legal position for all parties, including the regulators. So today I want to give you a quick overview from the direct insurer's viewpoint without repeating the very relevant points we've heard previously. Our session is about managing sanctions. And when commerce talks of managing sanctions, it means coping with the multiple regimes and requirements. The question I never hear answered or even asked is what are those who set sanctions doing to manage their proliferation? Sanctions, as you know, were again the first resort after the recent coup in Myanmar. So we can start by saying it is the role of insurance to support commerce and it is the aim of sanctions to prevent it. To expand that slightly controversial statement, the role of insurance is to mitigate risk, compensate loss and support commerce. The role of sanctions is a non-reflective mirror. It identifies risk, prevents sanctions, prevents transactions, including payment for losses and inhibits commerce for political policy reasons. They are basically asymmetric economic warfare via intermediaries. The effectiveness of sanctions over time is unclear, but a North Carolina University study found that multilateral sanctions were more likely to succeed and that unilateral sanctions were less effective. And of course, in recent years and of growing concern for commerce, there has been a strong and increasing preference by the United States in particular to try to achieve political and economic change by the use of its own unilateral financial sanctions rooted in the ubiquity of the dollar. And sanctions can take many forms, being diplomatic, financial, and military, and can be aimed at many targets from individuals and companies through to states and particular products. And they have great political appeal because they appear bloodless and gradual. The effects are both direct and perhaps more significantly in, in, indirect, and the extraterritorial reach of secondary sanctions mean that entities with US employees and any entity trading US dollars is similarly vulnerable. Sanctions are rarely effective as intended and can produce strife with allies. So we can look here at the damage done to US-German relations over Nord Stream 2. And then to add to the mix, there is anti-blocking legislation, which to put very simply is uh, where the EU will penalize traders who do not trade because one other country requires them not to. That leaves commerce between a rock and a hard place. More concerningly, we now have China experimenting with the same tool. And if that comes in, the consequences are difficult to predict. Unfortunately, errors are easily made when deliberate vagueness is allowed to be applied to the insurance industry, which is binary and depends on certainty and law. The devil is always in the detail, as uh, I think Tony Baker of the North noted a few years ago, the fear factor is a significant element of how sanctions operate in the US, and it is pleased with this and persists to apply a degree of uncertainty in the way they should be applied or interpreted so that people err on the side of safety. This is a deliberate play by the US, and it is aware of its strength. This play has been going on ever since, since a strict liability takes no prisoners. So insurers in both direct and P&I have no choice but to implement comprehensive due diligence measures to ensure compliance. Sadly, there is no fixed agreement as to what constitutes sufficient due diligence, so the good operators will always ask more questions, and the cost of the compliance uh, is borne by trading entities who ultimately have to pass some or all of the cost on to consumers. Now, as we know, since its formation, the UN has been the reference point for international cohesion. And we can all see the logic for restricting access to nuclear weapons. The UN, supported by the US and UK, therefore wants to prevent oil reaching North Korea, as it is being shipped there by somebody. Interestingly, North Korea is not, in fact, on the joint war listed areas as a high-risk area because 
no trade is done by London insurers, and to put it on that list will suggest that some was. Bearing in mind we have an audience that includes prominent tanker owners, we should be clear that it is the tanker sector that is most under scrutiny, together with all those associated, including charters, brokers, and insurers. The maritime advisories clearly outlined high expectations of due diligence and seeks to avoid, uh, achieve a result from industry that would have been attempted in the past by the use of an embargo. In response, uh, on reviewing the advisories, the Joint Com Hull Committee in London saw the need to implement a relevant control and did so with its AIS operation clause. Policymakers were looking for the industry to consider ceasing coverage if a vessel's AIS position signal was not received. And as we've heard, there are technical reasons why signals may be interrupted and a signal not received could not be taken as proof it was not sent. So although we examined the possibility of a mechanism that could be devised to terminate cover because of a break in such signals, it was apparent that much of the world fleet could be quite quickly uninsured as lost or interrupted signals were actually very common. And besides the practical issues of reinstating cover mid-risk, disputes were foreseeable were there to be an intervening loss when the ship was temporarily or permanently off cover. Further, it was felt the cessation of cover would not stop in itself illicit ship to ship transfers as insurers could not prevent the actions of those so involved, nor do they have constabulary powers themselves. For those reasons, the concept of terminating cover was found to be impractical. And insurers may additionally observe that it's an exceptionally rare criminal who is deterred from an enterprise because they lack cover. So concluding it was not proportionate or effective for everyone to monitor 24 seven as the net effect would be wide duplication of data and a lack of resource efficiency. The Joint Hull decided the best course would be to draft and release a wording that reinforced adherence to SOLAS and clearly showed underwriters had the means to require the production of AIS records in a claim situation. It has to be said that monitoring without enforcement cannot provide the desired result. In any case, AIS is already available to the intelligence community, but as we've seen, it's flawed and not an end in itself. There is, of course, LRIT, which is more reliable and available to flag states. So failure to use this data is something of a failure and responsibility at state level. It may be helpful to compare and contrast the Somalian emergency with sanctions. In Somalia, that required a naval presence embarked legal advisors <coughs> and a unified will to work against pirates in the interest of world trade. With sanctions, we have no naval presence, indirect legal enforcement, variable will, and the result works against world trade. These points do not add up to success. In maths, if the equation produces the wrong outcome, it is reworked. This suggests logically that it is time the rogue state problem was reworked because industry cannot solve political problems without political and or military support. What we have currently is an unbalanced transgression culture with strong enforcement against the inadvertent, but hardly any against the deliberate criminals who evade the rules. We live and trade in a highly complex and interconnected world which depends on the sea lanes and those who sail them. Sanctions and the necessary accompanying screening and diligence are making it increasingly problematic for legitimate traders to operate. My feeling is that industry would very much appreciate a return to the drawing board by the regulators as the use of sanctions is reaching the limits of effectiveness. For now, however, in conclusion, it is a case of if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I think that was really insightful um, and actually uh, provocative in some places as well. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we're moving on now to our final speaker, Simon Ring. Um, Simon is the Global Head of Maritime Trade Technologies and ESG at Polestar. Um, Simon heads up Polestar's Financial Markets and Compliance Division, working with trade financing banks, commodity trading companies, maritime insurers, flag administrators and governments with sanctions and regulatory exposure in maritime and transport firms. Under Simon's leadership, the company's purple <laughs> regulatory technologies have been awarded for innovation in reg tech solutions. 
Prior to joining Polestar in 2010, Simon worked in financial services, acting as a divisional managing director of derivatives at Telic Prebon in London and spending eight years in Geneva as the managing director of CEDES Capital Markets. Simon, over to you. Britt, thank you. Um, that uh, that history uh, is, uh, is 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 something I haven't haven't thought about for, for quite some time. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'm Simon uh, Ring. I head up uh, regulatory technologies and ESG for Polestar. Um, and in my role, I get a pretty holistic view uh, across many different industry sectors. As a company, Polestar works with around 1,200 shipping companies. Uh, in provisions of, of various technologies around vessel tracking, compliance, ship security alert systems, a whole bunch of technologies in that sector. We run the data centers for most of the major flag administrations, 60 of those around the world, including coast guards and governments. And in my specific role in, in terms of regula regulatory technologies, I, I work with hundreds of firstly uh, and primarily the, the, the banks and in, in terms of commodity and trade finance, many of the corporates and big trading groups that uh, that they finance. But I think as, as uh, previous panelists have talked about since May 2020, when um, the US Treasury and, and Coast Guard and, 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 and State Department issued their guidance, uh, we're seeing interest in, in our digital solutions now across um, various areas uh, uh, across the supply chains. Um, on, the, on the slide in front of you, I won't list the um, points that the regulators have made, made clear. I think Daniel did a, a pretty good job of doing that. But, but just to outline some of the challenges that were previous to May 2020 and some of the changes that we're seeing in regulatory technologies um, and the complexities around building a solution that is, is digital, that can automate and streamline programs and compliance process. And that's become almost um, well, much more important, I think, in times of lockdown. And even when you look at the way we're going back to work in, in, in hybrid so in, in hybrid format, where people are working remotely, where digital technologies can really help. Um, what you're looking at doing, the challenges really that you face uh, as, from our perspective is combining the data sets that people need in terms of sanctions and watch list data. We have a strategic alliance with Dow Jones in that regard. Um, the vessels, uh, names uh, of owners and benefactors, again, coming from the IMO appointed IHS uh, company, IHS uh, the data providers. But actually looking at what people need and everybody's risk parameters are different. Um, so you have to be able to engineer solutions that are, are in line with the risk parameters of, a, of, of an institution. Um, so clearly following that, we're looking at some of the, some of the, the, the issues that, uh, that we faced over the last three or four years and we built solutions for around the naming conventions and using IMO numbers opposed to names. Um, obviously the owners and, and, and associated companies to that vessel. Um, generating that record and audit trail for, for compliance purposes, as, as Camilla talked about, um, and obviously making sure that your data sets are completely up to date at, at, at any single point. Um, um, there are changes in, in, in financial market regulations very regularly. Somebody told me recently it's every 12 minutes. So these are, these are some of the key things that we've been working on uh, as a single service solution for, for, for industry. Next slide, please, Olga. So some of um, the previous panelists have talked about the, the key deceptive shipping practices. A lot of these were talked about um, in, in the, the, the guidance given by uh, State Department and others in, in May of 2020. Um, there was a, been a lot of talk about IS manipulation or disablement. And uh, I'll talk about that uh, a, a little bit later in, in the presentation. But I think it's important to point out that, that AIS is, is, is actually a, an anti-collision system. Um, it, it does operate on a VHF bro open broadcast databases, which makes it susceptible to manipulation. But there's actually no way of knowing whether a vessel's AIS has been turned off manually or it's lost connection through congestion or line of sight or other, other, other factors that can, 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 can impend on it. Uh, falsifying cargo and vessel documentation, we've talked about already, but the, the ship to ship transfers, vessel name changes, the physically altering of vessel identifications, 
um, flag hopping, voyage irregularities, and obviously something that is 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 part of, of shipping as an industry, the, the complex ownership structures that surround it. These are all key points. Um, Daniel and I probably went to, to most of the, the uh, State Department in, in various embassies around the world meetings that preempted the, the guidance uh, of May 2020. Um, but again, these are all the things that, that now technology has had to increase its, its profile and programs for, um, given the, the, the OFAC guidance that was issued. Uh, next slide, please. So, for about five years now, we've been working primarily to start with with the major banks that finance um, a lot of uh, the, the shipping industry, whether it's asset based or, or trade based. But essentially, our solutions, Purple Track, are a single service solution that incorporate data, uh, ownership data, watch list and enforcement action list data, uh, and our own vessel tracking solutions. And the idea really be behind this, and it was built with industry for industry, is the simplification of, of what is a very a, a, a very complex regulatory landscape a, a around the maritime trade sectors. So our own solutions are able to automate programs and process in seconds um, with single field of data entry points. So you don't have to be a compliance uh, expert to use these technologies. You just have to know the vessel's name or its IMO number. And the system within seconds can research the ownership, the management, its movement history, port state control data, um, right down to the ownership and benefactors, countries of origin, domicile and control. Um, obviously, that is, 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 is essentially where technology works really well. In, in, in my experience, most compliance officers are the, the most busy and the legal, legal guidance they get are the, are the busiest people in most institutions we work with. So technology in this respect, when you can automate and streamline the programs process, uh, are very good, it's very good at finding those needles in a haystack. Um, next slide, please. Something else that, that we've been focusing on more recently um, is, is the areas around trade-based money laundering. This really for us focuses around documentary fraud and whilst there's lots of innovation around digital doc documentations. It's been a while coming through. Um, but the, the FATF and Edmont Group put out some, some guidance on this more recently. The TBML programs around under and over pricing of goods are very complex. But the documentary piece is something that we have been working uh, at Impulsestar uh, at providing uh, solutions for. And on the next slide, um, you should. Olga, if you can go to the next slide. See a solution that we've added to our functionality sets. This is a solution that effectively, rather than screening vessels by their names or IMO numbers, people can actually enter the bill of lading code. Um, that will reach out through our technologies to the container, the, the, the carriers that are carrying those cargoes and essentially confirm that the, 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 the transaction is recognized and look at the singular or, or more than more than one vessel that could be associated with that journey. Screening vessels, again, in, in line with, with OFAC guidance, um, and again, automating and streamlining what is a very complex program. That There's lots of technologies that, that major institutions are, are starting to use now around OCR or fundamentally just comparing these kinds of documents, but, but that's something new that we've uh, instigated into our solutions more recently. Um, next slide, please. I'll run through the next ones quite quickly. There's been lots of talk about AIS. Uh, Neil mentioned um, what essentially is the tracking data that is used by governments and flag administrations. We think that many of our customers, uh, especially in, in, in operating in high risk areas with vessels that, that, that can move cargoes or can be transshipped, can look at using what we call our hybrid solution. So AIS we've touched on in terms of its vulnerabilities. Um, we can incorporate AIS and a combination of Inmarsat data for clients now that look and want to monitor vessels with, with more detail. Rather than artificial intelligence and algorithms trying to guesstimate where a vessel went when it went dark, uh, these solutions can actually fill those gaps and holes, um, negating much of the kind of false positives that uh, Camilla talked about um, and, and the need for investigations. So that's one way in which technology is, 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 is helping our clients and in terms of the vessel tracking piece by, by incorporating more data uh, in MOSAT, as many as you, uh, you know, is the medium used by 
governments and flags to, to report, uh, for vessels to report to uh, every six hours. Some of the other things on the next slide, please, Olga, that we've, we've incorporated. Again, these are pretty much in line with some of the STS risks. Um, it is possible now if you have a vessel and it goes dark for a period of time. Um, I mean, Daniel, you mentioned very clearly about, you know, the, the, the need and requirement to look back on vessels, trading patterns and histories. Uh, the guidance is 24 months, and I completely agree with you. If you looked at a vessel that hadn't reported for six hours over two years, then virtually every vessel in, in the world would be illicit on that basis. However, our clients determine their own gap uh, uh, analysis periods. Uh, in terms of what they determine a vessels uh, should be reporting on. Um, and we can analyze that with real data. But we can also get down to draft detection as well. So essentially, if you have a dark period for a vessel and following that dark period, there's been a change in its draft, that could alert some of our users to uh, an illicit STS transfer. Um, again, that due diligence, that, that, that enhanced program and process is, is where people come in to these investigations. Um, and lastly, I'll touch on, on, on one of the other things that uh, Neil mentioned around and, and Camilla mentioned around ship to ship transfers. So Olga, on the, on the next slide, we, we were talking about dark activity. Um, obviously with a hybrid solution, that dark activity can be limited and it can negate many false positives in terms of using our hybrid solutions. But again, STS risk, risk is something that is prevalent. It was talked about in, in the advisory in May 2020. And again, our solutions are, are being adapted to be able to uh, work with, with industry and our client base in, in all of those areas. Um, just to conclude, I, I, I'd like to, I'm very much in line with all the other panelists today. And the, you know, business needs to, needs to transact. It needs to, to move. Vessels need to keep moving. Um, and our, and our real drive and ambition in, in, in Polestar and our Purple Track solutions is very much around negating false positives, enabling business to transact, screen, and, and, and generate an audit trail for compliance very quickly, very fast, in seconds, and, and continue with their own business. So um, my time is up, so I will end there. Thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you so much, Simon. That was really very thought provoking. So, so thank you. Um, so we've heard now from all of our speakers um, and I'd invite them all to then to rejoin us, please, now. Um, and we have um, just a, a bit of time, sort of 15, 20 minutes or, now, or so now to just to discuss some of the um, topics that we've gone through and field some of our questions from the audience. I see we have some already in that Q&A function. And if anyone would like to ask some more, please go ahead and put those questions into the Q&A function. Um, I'm just seeing now, are we all back? I think we are. <laughs> Great. OK, so um, the, a question has come in um, on concerns of owners and managers, um, which sort of two quite connected questions here. So first of all, what are the primary concerns of owners and managers when it comes to navigating sanctions advisories? Um, and that also seems to connect somewhat with another question here regarding the blocking regulation. Is the US ROC bigger than the EU hard place, or is there an ability for an EU entity to work both with the US and Iranian entities? Um, Daniel, could I perhaps, um, could you perhaps start us off with, um, with that, with regard to any thoughts on owners and managers navigating sanctions advisories, what concerns they may have, and also perhaps anything you might want to add on, on blocking regulation, and then perhaps we can all chip in. Oh, Daniel, we can't hear you. Daniel, I think you seem to be on mute, although your mute thing is not showing. Is that working now? That's oh, better, yes. yes. That's <laughs> I, think, I think the danger of talking too much as a lawyer. But slightly, you... slightly louder would be great. Too well, isn't that, Daniel? I've got two mute buttons so that people can make sure I'm properly <laughs> muted. Forget me. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, it's the joys of modern technology, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar without someone being on mute. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's two massive targets. I think from my perspective and sort of advising clients, the main concerns that I see on a sort of day-to-day -day basis from owners and operators is really ensuring that we have well, two things, really. One is ensuring that owners have sufficient information to make sensible decisions. Um, so being able to identify the stuff, we, the stuff that they cannot do, but also being able to identify the stuff that they can. So I'd say that's the first thing that is a kind of... Um, a sort of primary concern. I think the other concern, and, and Simon and others have alluded to it, is that it's an interesting thing which things move quickly. 
we need to make decisions vessels are on subject or cargoes are available and there's, a, and there's a market and therefore being able to make those quick decisions without unnecessary duplication across different so if, if head owners and disponent owners and charters and sub charters and the various clubs and banks and others involved are all making the same are all doing the same checks and um, it can be very very time consuming and um, so i think from my perspective those are the two things getting the information and being able to make good decisions quickly um blocking regulation is, is hugely difficult i think that is, is one of those areas in which the, certainly the intention is for the us and the eu to be entirely opposed and to pull in diametrically different di directions um if you look back you know a number of different operators have been left essentially with very little choice other than to to, to stop iranian trade um, and certainly from my perspective now we see very few iran related inquiries it's, it's very difficult um yeah. i'd sort of be interested in, in the broad view of the panel and others as to whether we might see progress on iran hmm. um certainly from a personal perspective I, i'd like to see that um but i think it will drive complexity um rather than making yeah. things easier one of one of the points i think that we we recognize here is that um irrespective of of any um regulation and how it competes <laughs> Um, we also have the banks and their um, their stance to factor in. So whilst we may be, um, or our members may be able to um, to operate um, in compliance with with the um, with the EU uh, regs, in reality, um, it is almost impossible to transact any um, any financial business um, because the banks are so risk averse, and we find that um, a, a real technical difficulty. Yeah. Um, which, mm. which, um, which is important to note. Yes, agreed. I mean, with regard to the future with Iran, that's it's really one to watch, isn't it? And um, we may, you know, we sort of keep on this thing, and perhaps things will will move back in the right direction. One does wonder whether some damage has been done in terms of U.S. credibility with regard sort of in and out with Iran. Um, mm. And I do question whether or not banks. Um, I mean, they warmed up slightly when um, when things were easier. Um, a few years ago, uh, now obviously they're they're cold again, and, and whether there's trust, I suppose, to really get those banking transactions mm. flowing again, I think that's you know that's um, quite a difficult one. I go back to the uh, the early days that you remember, Daniel Jan, 2016, when the JCPOA first came into place, and the the, the vast majority of customers that we had didn't change their programs or their processes or their policies around it. And I think you've got to remember, you got elections in Iran in about three days, four days. And that that will have obviously an impact on. I, I I'm told that if you read the press, that that's a foregone conclusion. Who's going to take over here? But we shall see. Um, but yeah, that's that's from previous experience. I think, I think it's that's worth true, remembering I that. Uh, sorry. I, I was just about to say, it kind of goes to volatility, doesn't it? Sorry, Neil, I cut across you. Please, um, you you feel free. I just there was a one a welcome sign when uh, the incoming President Biden stated that he would the U.S. would lead not merely by the example of our power but the power of our example. So that was a, a good sign of new thinking, and I think we can be encouraged mm -hmm. by that. But in terms of you know, is the U.S. rock harder than the EU hard place? Well, in practical terms, yes. People will not risk infringing the dollar, where. The EU rules have to get rules to have yet to be So it's, it's a very difficult that, one. That importance, isn't it, on the US banking, and unless I think parties can move away from that reliance on US banking, that's going to be a exactly. permanent feature, isn't it? Yeah. yeah I, think that's, I think that's right. Um, we, have, we have another question, actually, um, and, and maybe this one is really um, directed firstly to you, Simon, and that is. Um, how does Polestar continue to stay ahead of the fast-changing game and provide up-to-date data to your clients? And that question, again, aligns with another one from our audience. Um, and that is um, an anonymous question. There could be a number of reasons why the software sends a warning. What other tools are deployed to investigate a breach? So um, I wonder whether you might uh, kick off on, on that topic. Yeah, sure. I, I think you have to have the best in breed data providers um, with any software solution for it to be viable. Um, you know, we work very closely with our strategic partners at Dow Jones. Um, we see them as one of the leading, if not the leading light in, in data and sanctions and watch list enforcement action lists. I'm sorry if I'm brief. Am I? 
sure if that's reverberating, yeah. but it's okay, yeah. good. Um, and obviously the updating of those data sets uh, every day um, is key and critical to that. But coming back to the second part of the question, I've yet to, uh, it would be unusual when we set up configurations for a client or a user that, that North Korea or Syria or Iran or yeah, a comprehensively sanctioned country doesn't play into that format, but it goes a lot wider than that. We have over a thousand watch lists from Dow Jones that people can choose and elect from. We have countries, regional risk, even down to port risk, and everybody's parameters are different. And the, the best way to negate false positives is to have the, the ability to engineer technology to everybody's own risk parameters. And what that generally does as well, it means that if you had a, have administrators to an account, they're normally the experts in crime or legal counsel from any institution. They set up that configuration and anyone anywhere in the world, all they're doing in that institution, wherever they trade, is entering a singular field of data. That again, negates false positives. When I talked about IMO screening, you know, there's 40 odd vessels called Pioneer in the world. You know, which one are you dealing with? The IMO is the only unique identifier. So we give the, the IMO or the name as an option, but it's the IMO number that generates all of the background information in, in our tech solutions uh, on, on the vessel and its ownership and its movement history. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a real challenge, isn't it? Trying to reduce this kind of complexity of you know, how many different vessels are you looking at and all the rest. And I mean, the, do you think there is then broadly as sort of a, a, a risk of this duplication in these KYC searches that sort of slows things down? I think, Daniel, you mentioned that. You know, I wonder if there's any there's any possibility. Certainly, we've sort of thought about here. It would be really nice, and I know you know companies are moving towards this. Technology companies, a place where it's kind of a, a go to for everything, isn't it? Because I feel at the moment you, you know you need to have some understanding of the sanctions regimes, but you you need to be screening, you need to be too. tracking. So yeah. yes, I think in some we yes, we, we, as I think our understanding is yeah. in some I think in some European countries there has to be everybody agreed on a certain go or no go on parties. I don't know if anyone has any views on that. Um, there's also a, a point there, Simon, that you raised about um, about false positives, and um, and that's something here at the club that we um, we find kind of a challenge, I suppose, and that's when we have to um, speak to a member um, and say, um, hey, look, you know, our data shows that you're um, trading in Iran, or what are you doing, you know, and you have to ask these questions. Um, mostly we get answers back which are oh gosh really like you know no I'm not or what's happening and they, they explain but um, we have to be very careful that we're open transparent on the same side on the same page and not accusatory and um, and, and uh, you know we are not the police um, we are there just to um, to assist and make sure that everybody's doing I, well. I, I hear that from so many clients you know we're not mi5 we're a business and and i and i completely com, you know, c conclude that that's absolutely right but i think good reg tech does a multitude of things but it should make life easier faster more efficient um it does have to engage with human beings but in bigger institutions what we find is that that, that compliance can be led by technology so they can be shown alerts that need their attention rather than trying to look across a broad spectrum of risk. Um, if you can define that, dedicate it down, give people the tools to investigate it properly and thoroughly, then then you can move forward. And I, in most of the bigger banks that we deal with, this is a major issue, you know, the, the, the amount of documentation. One of the other questions here is about EBLs. You know, it's EBLs have been around for what, 10, 15 years? Uh, yeah. It needs adoption at a country level, which some have. But it also needs uh, that standardization across the industry. You know, you can have an importer and exporter agreeing on using a, a, a digital document in a certain format. But unless the, both of the banks and the carrier agree to use that singular format, you're no further forward. And that's one of the reasons we built BLV, because it fills that gap and hole where you can actually get determination from a trusted partner, i.e. A, a carrier in this case, that the vessel, rec they recognize that bill, that transaction is real, and there's no fraud involved in, the, in, in that particular um, bill of lading. Indeed, sure. Indeed. I actually saw on the list there, maybe an, I, uh, an IG um, kind of uh, plug kind of question yes, there. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do have something there. 
how do the how could PI Club support members on managing sanctions risks except from providing advice for guidance only? Are there other services that could also provide and, and assist members um, with compliance? Yeah, I mean that's a really interesting question and um, actually very pivotal, I think, because it's actually we often we often do say, and I, um, of course we can help, we can give guidance and all the rest. It's really very much though for the individual owners, and that's not always sound very helpful when people are sort of fresh to this, particularly. But you know, really people have to be quite careful about um, managing their own risks, and um, mm -hmm. not least because here, for example, us we're at the club, we primarily need to be thinking about we try to help the members. We also have to think about the position of our own position as insurers. So it's important. Um, the owners take their own advice that's specific to them. Um, obviously, they can take legal advice, and we often recommend that they do do that for their own um, interest to, to look after their own interests. And, and obviously, we have the various um, tools and technologies. Although I do think, you know, sort of bringing bringing us back to that question of concerns of owners and managers in navigating these advisories and risks. I mean, there is concern, I think, particularly for the smaller um, owner and operator, that those software tools are. Um, expensive and and also require you know dedicated resources so you know these are i think some of the some of the challenges aren't they trying to kind of look after your risks but also keep you know keep moving with your with your business yeah and and, and we, we found we've, we've had instances of that um and it also plays into um, due diligence so a member for instance or an, own, an owner operator um, wanting to buy a vessel um and sees one um that looks amazing um with amazing terms um, buys it and then finds out that it's tainted somehow by its history in relation to sanctions. Um, then there's the whole host of difficulties that that member um, or, or, or operator is mm. in. Um, and it's, it's that sort of thing, very difficult to mm. manage, um, a lot of work and, and a lot of cost. Yeah. Um, Daniel, do you find, um, do, do you kind of get quite repeat questions for advice? And then I, I guess that somehow leads to you, you're giving some advice on general programs that people could put into place. That's right. Make sure I unmute properly this time. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, the same things will come along. So we'll see either there's a change in the legislation and there's a, there's a new restriction. And then clearly that affects a number of different people. And, and therefore, we would look at it for all of them. Um, or and I think what we talked about quite a lot is the challenge that comes from sanctions being imposed where they weren't there. So mm. whether we're thinking about Belarus or Neil mentioned Myanmar, um, mm. but I think actually sometimes the bigger challenge is when they're lifted, because you suddenly get an, an opportunity present, mm. but they tend not to be listed entirely. So, so Simon touched mm. on January 16 when we saw the the sanctions relief on Iran, and I remember getting a call from a, a very overexcited broker who had understood that sanctions had been lifted but had inferred from that that everything had been lifted. Yes, indeed. Um, and it, I think that I think that also presents a challenge because everyone's everyone's looking for opportunity, um, but it's about making sure that we, we take the right opportunities. And did we have 64 day snapback last time? I remember Daniel, which put the fear yeah, of God into most people as well, but yeah, you know, yeah. um, change policies for big companies, 64 days is yeah. a long time. Yeah. Uh, we have these wind down as well. We have sometimes people get excited about the wind down, but I've got this much time left to do all these things. Well, not to start new things, but no, to know, wind down. Wind down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Neil, uh, uh, do you do you have a, a, a comment to add to to, uh, to to this point? Certainly on on that point, no, because obviously I don't work for P and I. But um, I would, there's there's a question in the chat about e bills and does the cyber mm. risk outweigh the benefit? I could comment on that. Um, I mean, all, yes, the biggest loss, all the biggest losses have very good paperwork, if not perfect. And if the intent is to deceive, then doing it by electronic means is a really good path to do it. And blockchain is unbreakable if it started out with the intent to deceive. And that's quite a concern. Um, I, I hesitate to use the word cyber because no one agrees what it means, but I'm going to call it software. And if someone wants to program their way into something, they will. And if it's made easier by the internet, then you have corresponding higher risk. And it does have to be balanced, I think, in the interest of common sense. How how wide do you open access to these systems? And of course, everyone will say they're, they're fully protected and so on. And, and that just is a challenge to somebody to get in through the back door. So it's, it's very, very difficult to balance. There is a need to improve um, the process at port uh, because you know, delays do 
arise when documentation cannot be received. So it has to be done in a controlled manner, unfortunately. Uh, it's a common sense answer. No, I think that's right. I think that's, um, yes, that's that very pertinent. Um, I think we are slightly over time. Um, so I think we're going to have to close the, uh, the session now. Um, I'd like to thank, firstly, um, Maritime London and Joss for setting this up, of course, um, from the Embassy. Also, um, I'd like to thank the, uh, the speakers. Um, thank you all very much for your, um, for your comments and slides. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience as well for supplying us with some um, really great questions. Um, the slides and the con contact information uh, are going to be uploaded onto this platform, um, which I think Joss mentioned at the beginning would be available for uh, today and tomorrow as well, I think. Um, also, please remember the networking um, opportunity. Um, there is a facility for that and the expo. Um, and I think that we will have a short break now and we will see you back um, in the audience um, for the decarbonisation session. And that, I believe, starts at 1.30 UK time and 3.30 Greek time. So um, with that, I say thank you to everybody and um, see you after the break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.